Now, welcome back to our regular podcast, Endoscopy News podcast. And again, thanks a lot to Pentax for supporting our podcast. Today, we got a range of topics, including a, an update on eosinophilic esophagitis, a little bit about ERAT. I don't know if you know about that. Acute cholangitis, an interesting study on uh, transplantation and how that affects your risk of developing uh, colonic polyps. An update on the management of walled up pancreatic collections. An update on the risk of bleeding after endoscopic resection in the stomach. My old favorite, whether indole carmine dye is unbeatable for the recognition of early gastric cancer. Another update on how to, well, can we improve the FIT test? Colonic surveillance for Lynch syndrome, which you know is a bit of an old bugbear of mine. I, I do worry about patients with Lynch syndrome and I'm unconvinced that regular colonic surveillance can actually stop people from developing cancer. And we finish uh, on a plea for guideline developers. Anyway, let's kick off. Eosinophilic esophagitis, just to give you an update, the AGA has been involved in recommending the international guidelines on diagnosis and management for this condition. And the guidelines are, I must admit, a little bit uh, vague. It basically says uh, you can use PPI, you can use topical steroids, that's a steroid you, you have in, in a steroid inhaler, which you swallow instead of inhaling it. Uh, and you should use topical steroids in preference to systemic steroids. No surprise there. You can consider an elemental diet, although patients may reasonably decline because it's awful. Um, allergy testing, trying to predict what, what the food allergies are, uh, is probably not very accurate. Dilate the strictures. Well, of course you dilate the strictures. Uh, some medications, uh, and this is probably the, the most, or the, or the most important part of the guideline, some medications should only be used in, in a clinical trial, and that includes anti-IL-3, IL-4, IL-5, and anti-IL-13 medication, as well as Montelukast, uh, chromalin sodium, immunomodulators such as, for example, anti-TNF therapy, that should all only be used in trials. And finally, it says uh, we should avoid anti-IgE therapy entirely. So, how does this then pan out on a, in, in a real-world setting? This is the first uh, article entitled Efficacy of Therapy for Isinophilic Esophagitis in the Real-World Practice. Well, actually, it's a Spanish practice. It's a, they have this... Um, uh, eosinophilic esophagitis connect database of about 600 patients uh, they say european centers but all the authors are spanish in this study so i presume it's a, it's a spanish database anyway they looked at the management of 589 patients this in 75 percent of cases it was a ppi which was the first medication tried and that induced a remission in 50% of patients. That's good, isn't it? Uh, only 10% of patients had uh, in, uh, in, uh, swallowed steroids, topical steroids as the first treatment, but that was more effective. It induced a complete remission in 68% of patients. Uh, elimination diets were only used in 8% of cases, so no surprise there, and it wasn't particularly effective either. Only induced a remission in about 52% of patients. Well, I guess by the time you're on to elimination diet, you're, you're struggling really. These patients probably failed or relapsed on both PPI and swallow steroids. So to have a 50-50 chance of improving on an elimination diet is probably worth taking. Um, so the take-home message from that study was that PPI therapy for eosinophilic esophagitis is surprisingly effective. And I think that would be my first choice. Then there's another study on the topic of EOE uh, published in Clinical Gastro HEP entitled Effectiveness and Safety of High versus Low Dose Swallow Topical Steroids. And that's uh, basically from five uh, EOE centers in the US and in Switzerland. And uh, that included 82 patients. Um, two-thirds of patients actually relapsed on, uh, on uh, treatment with steroids. 
So all of the uh, remission rate is about two thirds. The relapse rates of those two thirds is probably after about a year, two thirds again. So at the end of the day, the lasting remission in patients with topical steroids may only be about 50%. Anyway, they found that a high dose steroids, that's more than half a milligram per day, uh, was a little bit quicker in inducing a remission in symptoms and relapse was happened earlier in patients given a low dose of topical steroids, low dose being less than half a milligram per day. So therefore, we should probably start, start with a above half a milligram per day, be prepared for a relapse. Now, do you know what ERAT is? Now, ERAT stands for Endoscopic Retrograde Appendicitis Therapy. Uh, you might have heard about this, actually. The, the whole idea was first published back in 2012 from a Chinese center. And um, the reference is on the website. So this is patients with, a, with acute uh, appendicitis. And you do a colonoscopy with a cap at the end of your scope. Uh, you get to the appendix uh, orifice. And there you insert a catheter over a guide wire into the appendix lumen. And then you put dye down into the uh, appendix to outline the anatomy. If you see a fecal lith, you try to remove it with either a basket or a retrieval balloon. If there's a stricture, uh, you, you don't actually dilate it. You, st uh, you place a straight biliary plastic stent to allow drainage. There's been another update from another Chinese center uh, published in surgical endoscopy, and that included 210 patients. They compared ERAT treatment versus laparoscopic appendicectomy and open surgical appendicectomy. They reported that colonoscopy took on average 48 minutes, which was actually quicker than it took for a laparoscopic appendicectomy, which took an average of 67 minutes. And the open surgery was even slower. That took a total of 85 minutes to do. ERAT therapy was cheaper than surgery. Now, unfortunately, the recurrence rate of appendicitis after endoscopic treatment was 1 in 30, just during the first six months after therapy. So that's quite a high rate. Uh, you want to be cured of your appendicitis. You don't want to have a flare-up every few years, do you? Uh, more worrying in this study, there were 13 patients who developed an appendicular abscess. And the author said that that wasn't really a problem because if the patient developed an appendicular abscess, we simply did a, another colonoscopy and the, we found the cecal, cecal wall which was kind of indented by the fluctuating abscess. Uh, and then we cut through to allow drainage of the abscess cavity from the peritoneum into the cecum. That sounds horrendous. Anyway, enough about ERAT. We're moving on to acute cholangitis and the timing of ERCP. Uh, as you know, acute cholangitis is a medical emergency linked with a 2 to 5% mortality rate. And ERCP can, of course, be life-saving. Now, several meta-analyses have shown that uh, there can be a 20% mortality reduction if you offer ERCP promptly soon after admission. The 2019 ESG guideline recommended ERCP within 42 to 72 hours for cases of moderate cholangitis and within 12 hours for those with severe acute cholangitis. Now, ERCP in the middle of the night is difficult to set up, of course. It, it relies on an around-the-clock immediate availability of CT and, and, and imaging. Uh, you need to have nurses, imaging stuff, anaesthetist, intensivist, and of course the, an ERCP is available at 3 o'clock in the morning. And it can also be a little bit difficult, I think, to distinguish between moderate cholangitis and severe cholangitis. Uh, severe cholangitis, if the patient actually end up with septic shock, the mortality rate is close to 100%. Now, it's worth mentioning the Tokyo definition of what uh, a moderate cholangitis is. That, that, and that is basically cholangitis, confirmed cholangitis with a white cell count above 12, fever above 39, and the patient older than 75, bilirubin of 85, or hypoalbuminemia. Now, a severe case of cholangitis is when you have disturbance of 
cardiovascular, neurological, respiratory, renal, hepatic or hematological system, sepsis really. These are the patients that need urgent ERCP within 12 hours of admission, which basically means the next morning after the patient's been admitted in the, the, uh, in the middle of the night. And there's a study from Harvard comparing ERCP within 6 hours or 12 hours of uh, presentation. They had a total of 487 patients with cholangitis accumulated over nine years and uh, length of hospitalization was very similar between patients offered ERCP within six hours or 12 hours and there was no difference in complication rates or length of ICU stage or mortality. So that's reassuring because most tertiary referral centers are of course unable to offer emergency ERCP in the middle of the night. It might have been interesting perhaps to learn about outcomes comparing ERCP within 12 hours versus 24 hours. But anyway, my own take home message from this study is that any patient with evidence of septic shock need ERCP within 12 hours. And then we move on to an interesting study of uh, the risk of coronary polyps after solid organ transplantation. It's just an out of interest study really. It was published in Digestive Diseases and Sciences and it was looking at the 295 transplant recipients. This group was compared with an age and sex matched control and they basically reported that patients who received a transplant had more large adenomas, 10 millimeter or larger, compared to controls. Uh, the difference was 9% versus 4%. So that's surprising, isn't it? It looks like immunosuppression may suppress our body's ability to keep rogue DNA in check. Or alternatively, does it mean that um, if you are on a transplant list, attending for screening colonoscopies is, is a low priority. <laughs> the study didn't really tell if these patients had any previous colonoscopies. Anyway, an update on the management of walled off pancreatic collections, pseudocysts in common parlance. Uh, this was a retrospective cohort study in a single American center. It was entitled Predicting the Need for Step-Up Therapy After EOS Guided Drainage of Pancreatic Fluid Collections with a Lumen Opposing Metal Stent. The step-up therapy, so these are patients who didn't get better or got worse, sepsis uh, came back. Uh, then the step-up therapy included a direct endoscopic necrosectomy, maybe finding an additional drainage site or surgery, of course, uh, surgical drainage. Anyway, there were 136 patients who had the collections drained with a stent. Half of these patients required a step-up therapy. And the predictors of the need for step-up therapy, including a pseudocyst measuring larger than 10 centimeters, when the pseudocyst extended down in the paracolic gutter, or if EUS showed that there were more, more than 30% solid necrosis within the walled off necrosis. These patients were very likely, between four and eight times more likely, of requiring step-up therapy. That leads me on to another study on the topic of walled off necrosis entitled endoscopic necrosectomy with and without hydrogen peroxide and basically adding hydrogen peroxide improved the results. 95% of patients who had hydrogen peroxide washouts of their walled off necrosis had a successful outcome versus 80% of those who were randomized not to have hydrogen peroxide. Resolution was quicker with hydrogen peroxide than without and there were no difference in complication rates or post-procedural bleeding. So clearly we should use hydrogen peroxide when we try to clean up a walled off necrosis. Now moving on to a huge Japanese study of uh, a number of centers looking at the risk of bleeding. Well, the study is entitled a Timing of Bleeding and Thromboembolism Associated with ESD for Early Gastric Cancer in Japan. And it included more than 10,000 patients who had the early gastric cancer treated endoscopically with ESD. But of course, the bleeding rate is no different with ESD versus EMR. Anyway, the overall post 
resec endoscopic resection bleeding rate was four and a half, four point seven percent really. The average time between your uh, endoscopy and the bleeding was four days, which is interesting. The Japanese keep the patients in for five days after their ESD gastric ESDs. The Late bleeding rates were 3% in patients not taking any antithrombotic medication, 9% in patients taking antiplatelet therapy, 15% in patients taking anticoagulants, and 30% of patients taking both antiplatelet and anticoagulants. That's a high rate, isn't it? Other risk factors for bleeding included, and these are familiar to all of us, chronic kidney disease, hemodialysis, larger lesion size, multiple lesions, having lesion resected in the antrum. I always thought that there was more bleeding and retroversion at the fundus, but this huge study actually tells us it's the antrum which is the bleeding site in the stomach. In, in the colon, we know it's the right hemicolon. Cirrhosis is another cause of late bleeding, and of course, yes, gastric yeast, the impatient with cirrhosis, is a messy business. Ischemic heart disease and being male, of course being male. There were only, and this is reassuring, there were only three cases of thromboembolic events. That was two strokes and one TIA in 10,000 patients. But the study doesn't really go into any details how the, these patients were managed, their anticoagulation were managed. Uh, I guess in the UK, we would probably stop anticoagulation for a week or so after a gastric ESD, unless we could close it all with clips, um, which, of course, if the lesion is bigger than three centimeters, is difficult. Anyway, there's some figures there for you so that you can quote these in your consent forms. Um, on the topic of early gastric cancer, there was a study of the use of indigo carmine dye to find early gastric cancers. Again, it's uh, it was a retrospective analysis of uh, only one uh, Japanese center. And they compared several image modalities. And they, th they thought that something called linked color imaging, which, as you know, is a proprietary Fujifilm technology, was as good or perhaps even better than indigo carmine dye spray. They looked at 87 early gastric cancer lesions, retrospectively thought that linked color imaging was pretty pretty good it was certainly better than the other imaging modalities including blue laser imaging uh, which is another fujifilm technology i guess you use what you got access to and uh, everyone got access to indigo carmine dye which remains my go-to dye there was another study comparing near focus imaging and uh, nbi that's a limpus technology there for you to outline the margins of early gastric cancers. This was published in the journal Gastroenterology and Hepatology uh, entitled Narrowband Imaging with Near Focus Imaging for Discriminating the Gastric Tumor Margin Before EMR, a prospective randomized multicenter trial from South Korea. As you know, if you've been following our uh, case quizzes, I find it difficult to use the Olympus Near Focus Imaging and uh, an NBI to see the, the edges of uh, early gastric cancers. And this study included 200 patients who had near focus imaging NBI and uh, 195 patients who had indigo carmine dye to outline the margins of the early gastric cancer. And this study actually concluded that uh, indigo carmine dye was superior. But well, I could have told them that. Moving on to another topic, and that's I don't know if you do this in your center. Colonic um, detorsion for a sigmoid volvulus. And this is a study from Turkey, a retrospective case review from a single center in Turkey, looking at their outcomes. I must say that in my center here in Leeds, this is something that the surgeons do. And we have access to what's called the, the, the scope guide, which tells you the configuration of the, of the colon, which I think probably makes it a bit easier to detorsion it. You don't want to torsion it the wrong way, do you? So now you've got two twists in your sigmoid. Anyway, out of a total of 73 endoscopic detorsions, they were unsuccessful in 21 patients, that's 30%. The predictors of failure 
was neuropsychiatric disease. Don't really know how that why that would affect outcome. Sigmoid diverticular disease, which I can understand. Previous abnormal surgery, which I can understand. Although there was an early Japanese study from 2017, I remember, that indicated that patients who's had surgery before were more likely to have a successful endoscopic T torsion. So that's a bit controversial, perhaps. Abnormal tenderness was a poor predictive sign. Onset of symptoms for more than 48 hours. A mean intraabnormal pressure greater than 15 millimeter of mercury. A cecum bigger than 10 centimeters in diameter. And as you know, the bigger the cecum gets, the more likely the patient is to perforate. When you come up to 12 centimeters, you're in danger area. And a higher CRP was a poor prognostic factor. So I guess <laughs> reading this study, it's not for the first time in medicine that we found that the patient with the greatest need of something to work, uh, of a medical intervention to work, is precisely the group who are the least likely to actually benefit from this intervention. So the people with the biggest cecums were the least likely to benefit. Hmm, interesting. Now, as you know, we used to use GAIAC based uh, fecal occult blood testing here in the UK. But then uh, a couple of years ago, we changed to a fit test. And uh, that's been a real debacle because all of a sudden uh, uptake goes up. Uh, but I remember being told, look, the great thing about fit testing is that it's read by a machine. So you tweak a knob on that machine to change the sensitivity to a sensitivity that tallies with your colonic capacity, which sounds great. So it was a study published in GUT looking at this transition from FOB to fit testing in Scotland. The Scottish uh, National Health Service predicted a 10% increase in colonoscopy demand with moving on to a fit testing. That turned out not to be the case. Uh, fit uptake was increased by 10%. Well, it went from 56% to 64%, 8%. Uh, the test positivity went from 2% to 3%. Positive predictive value for cancer was 5% with a, with a FIT test, but 6% with the old-fashioned FOB test. So it actually was a fall in the predictive value. Positive predictive value for high-risk adenomas uh, increased from 90% with the FOB to 24% with the FIT testing. So the conclusion of the study was that the FIT pilot then got it completely wrong. It severely underestimated the uptake and the positivity rate, caused a 67% increase in colonoscopy demand compared to the predicted 10%. <laughs> Clearly, that knob on the fit testing reading machine is welded into place isn't it it can't be moved of course what then happened is covid happened so it was interest with interest that i read an article looking at a new novel markers of stool dna methylation uh, it was published in colorectal disease and uh, is basically a meta-analysis of 46 studies totaling about 16,000 patients. Uh, it was conducted in uh, by an American center. And they looked at all these novel new stool tests for cancer and said that the most accurate methylation test was the one looking for the SDC2. But that had a sensitivity of 83% and a specificity of 90%, 91%. But of course, this means that 15% of patients with a cancer had a false negative test, and more worryingly, nearly 10% of patients who were tested had a false positive test. I don't quite think that's ready for primetime TV, but... And the authors concluded that perhaps a testing for a bank of different uh, methylation markers is the way to go. Now, as you know, in aviation, uh, flight hours matter. If you haven't been up in the air for a certain number of hours, then you need those hours in a simulator. And uh, the surgeons also know that the number of procedures that they do, the number of hemicolectomies they do, or esophagectomies, is linked with their success rate and complication rate. 
So it was with interest I looked at a systematic review of 20, 27 studies of a, a total of 11 million colonoscopies to look at flight hours, i.e. number of colonoscopies done versus quality. Uh, the study was, uh, was uh, entitled Association between Endoscopies, Annual Procedure Volume and Colonoscopy Quality, a Systematic Review and Meta-Analysis from uh, Canada. <laughs> they reported that there appeared to be no link between procedural volume and adenoma detection rate, and there was no link between procedural volume and post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer rate. <laughs> this is all very disappointing. However, they reported that the cecal intubation rate seemed to improve with each additional uh, 100 annual procedures. They did mention, though, that it was really hard to find studies where the colonoscopist did anything less than 100 annual procedures. And of course, if you are a colonoscopist who does less than 100 colonoscopies a year, you're probably a little bit unlikely to volunteer your data for scrutiny because you know you're on somewhat shaky ground, I expect. It's difficult to know, isn't it? Now, moving on to a brilliant study of acute mountain sickness and the effect that has on the stomach. This was a prospective study of 25 Swiss mountaineers. And these tough, hardy 25 Swiss mountaineers all had gastroscopies at uh, surface levels, which in Switzerland is about 400 meters over sea level. And then they went up the mountainside and did um, uh, gastroscopies again after two days and four days after uh, spending time at 4,500 meters. And it's quite appalling fineness, actually. The frequency of any endoscopic lesion increased from 12%, 12% of these 25 people had some gastric lesion at, um, at ground level, uh, and that increased to 60% after four days up on the mountain. There were nobody who had a, a peptic ulcer at ground level, but that increased to 22% of these people uh, up on the mountainside. You could predict who had the most lesions because they didn't feel hungry anymore. Awful. Mountain sickness feels awful. And I'm looking forward now to a study of colonoscopy at the top of Mount Everest. It'll be really interesting to find out what that reveals. Now, moving on, there were two studies on the topic of Lynch syndrome. The first one is entitled Yield of Lynch Syndrome Surveillance for Patients with, pathogen with the Different Pathogenic Variants in the DNA Mismatch Repair Genes. These authors from Rotterdam uh, looked at uh, 264 patients with Lynch syndrome who underwent a total of 916 surveillance colonoscopies. Uh, surveillance revealed nine cancers. And uh, the most important finding of this study was that patients with a mutation in the MSH6 mismatch repair gene seemed to have a lower risk of developing adenomas and cancers than the other groups. So that's interesting. And that dovetails with another study published in the Clinical Gastroenterology and Hepatology entitled Associations between Mutations in MSH6 and PMS2 and the Risk of Finding Surveillance Detected Colorectal Cancer. This was a slightly larger study from New Zealand of 381 people who underwent a total of 2,000 colonoscopies over a four and a half year period. In spite of um, these regular colonoscopies, 5% of patients, 18 of them in fact, developed bowel cancer. Uh, the risk of developing a bowel cancer was the same whether you had a mutation in the MLH1 or the MSH2 gene, but patients with a mutation in the MSH6 gene had a much lower risk of developing cancer. 94% uh, were diagnosed with early bowel cancer and nobody died from the disease. So that is reassurance of sorts. Um, so I wonder, should we relax a little on our surveillance intensity in patients with Lynch syndrome and the MSH6 variant? Or alternatively, should patients with a mutation in MLH1 or MSH2 
be offered a colectomy instead of surveillance. And only patients with a mutation in the MSH6 should be offered surveillance. But then again, no one actually died from the bowel cancer. So the, the colonic surveillance in this group of Lynch patients did actually do something. I remain intensely uncomfortable with providing surveillance colonoscopy for patients with Lynch syndrome. And of course, we know from the emerging post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer data here in the UK that if you want to avoid this debacle, then you shouldn't do any surveillance because patients with inflammatory bowel disease or Lynch syndrome and all these uh, predispositions, they are the ones that develop the post-colonoscopy colorectal cancer. Anyway, that's my paranoia talking. And that leads me to the final study uh, entitled The Optimal Age to Stop Endoscopic Surveillance of Barrett's Esophagus, a Comparative Cost-Effective Analysis. And uh, this was published, um, it's a joint kind of American-Dutch study published in Gastroenterology uh, this week. And uh, they basically used three independently developed economic models to simulate patients with stable Barrett's, that's non-dysplastic Barrett's, and when the right place is to, to stop surveillance. And they're quoting the, the pay threshold of $100,000 per quality adjusted life years. And basically, a man with no comorbidities is reasonable to stop surveillance at the age of 81. Uh, the corresponding age for a woman is 75 because they're less likely to develop Barrett's cancer, of course. If you have a, an elderly gentleman with, with a mild comorbidity, you can stop surveillance age 80, 73 for a woman. If you have a man with moderate comorbidities, I guess that would be, say, ischemic heart disease and hypertension, something like that, uh, the reasonable to stop Barrett's surveillance at the age of 77. Uh, or 73 if the person is a woman. If you have a, a man with severe comorbidities, perhaps previous heart attacks, strokes, atrial fibrillation, the study concludes that uh, a reasonable time to stop surveillance is age 73 or 69 for a woman. Interesting. My generation of gastroenterologists has, of course, completely failed to pay any attention to cost, resource implications, climate impact of surveillance. We also subject our patients to uncomfortable surveillance from which they are unlikely to benefit whilst squandering money and resources, which of course could be used in better places perhaps. But so far the only guideline I have seen any discussion about uh, an appropriate time to stop is with our latest uh, UK colonic polyp guidelines. And that concludes our uh, podcast. Thanks for listening. And I look forward to catching up with you again in uh, a couple of weeks time. And again, thanks to Pentax for your support without which this podcast would not be feasible. Imagine a world where every single detail is designed to save lives. Where everyone works for the benefit of patient health and comfort as well as clinical institutions. By delivering cleverly engineered technology and dedicated services to support your fight against diseases, cancer, and infections. A world where you will always find smart and sophisticated answers to your daily challenges. This is the world of Pentax Medical. Welcome to the world of intelligence.